What's up guys, it's Topsy and welcome to the final installment of raiding every single speed dual deck from the sealed boxes. And we're finally here. The OG itself, the set that started all the sealed boxes and I'm quite excited to cover this one. As I mentioned at the beginning of the first video from this series, this is the one box that I have the least amount of experience with just because when it came out I never got around to actually buying it and I highly regret that now. This set is very iconic and it's the set that I believe truly gave Speed Jewels its identity that it has now. But before we get started, I did have a few things that I wanted to go ahead and mention real quick. First thing is uh, I want to go ahead and give a quick shout out to all of you guys that have been watching all my videos and commenting. I've been having a blast going ahead and interacting with you guys in the comments section and has been super enjoyable for me doing this whole series. Also, if you guys are interested in filling up this tier list yourself, I have a link in the description below that leads you straight to my tier list so you guys can go ahead and give it a quick try on your own. And if you do end up making your own tier list of this, uh, feel free to go ahead and tag me on Twitter, uh, Instagram, or uh, whatever. Uh, my links to my socials are in the description below as well, so I'd love to see your guys' own tier list and compare them to mine. Lastly, we're super close to 300 subscribers. And if you guys could do me a huge favor, leave a like, subscribe, I'd greatly appreciate that, guys. You have no idea how much. But with all that being said, Let's just get started. Okay, so as per usual, we are grading all these decks based on the following criteria. We're going to be grading it based on the 20 card deck you're expected to play, the skill you're expected to use alongside the deck, and of course, we're also going to be grading upon, upon the consistency of the deck, the power output of the deck, and overall the quality of the cards within each of these decks. So with that being said, Yugi. He is the first deck we're going to be grading, and this is a interesting one because um, a trend that we've seen in later boxes is that pretty much almost every single box you get, they're all kind of like archetype based and they have a certain theme to them. Yuki's deck is interesting just because it has a theme kind of, but it's mostly just like a bunch of pile of cards that I guess kind of work. You'll see what I mean. But not ironically, this is a really good strategy and I was super surprised because I thought this was going to be kind of bad to mediocre. And in my opinion, I think it goes, let's see. I think it goes above the Archfiend strategy, not ironically. Um, I think I might even put it above Geoffrey. Yeah, I think that's where it belongs. Let's go ahead and just talk about why. All right, so as I said, Yuki's deck is interesting just because it has a theme, but there's no real archetype behind it. The whole point of this deck is meant to be to bring out Dark Magician and Buster Blader in order to make Dark Paladin. That's the whole gimmick of the deck. Um, and alongside that, we have interesting cards like Akumador, just as a defensive piece. We have Archuna Gilfer, which is a card that I'm like, okay with. I don't mind it. Swift Guy is actually a huge addition to the deck just because it's a really good normal summon. Kaiku is always phenomenal. Skill Way Magician and Skill Bird Magician are a bit underwhelming. These cards aren't great. Um, they're funny, but eh. I would have loved to have seen a uh, skilled black magician here instead, but I know it was a card that was introduced in Streets of Battle City. So, you know, it is what it is. Breaker the Magical Warrior is always a great card to see. This is one of the best normal summons in the game, or at least it used to be one of the best. It's still pretty good though. Um, as for the spell cards, the first one we get shown is Book of Moon. In my opinion, the best card in all of Speed Duels. Such a versatile card, such a powerful card. So this is a great addition to this deck. Uh, moving on to the spell cards, this is where it gets kind of funny, actually. So as you can see, pretty much every card here revolves around the fusion. We have Dark Magic Curtain and Emblem of the Dragon's Destroyer in order to search out your pieces, Dark Magician and Buster Blader. Then after that, we have Polymerization, Fusion Recycling Plant and Destruction Swordsman Fusion. All three of these cards pretty much enable you to perform a fusion summon, which is super funny to see how hard they went into this. And lastly, we do have Deep Fusion, which... At first, I was a bit iffy on, but after thinking about it and testing it out, it's a pretty neat card just because during certain game states, you're able to just like defuse the uh, Dark Paladin just to go into for game with cards like Dark Magician and Buster Blader on the field, which is super cool. Wrapping up the cards in the deck, we have the Trap cards, which are, um, they're okay. Magical Hats is a funny card. Fairy Wind is an interesting way of uh, back removal. Dark Light's a really interesting card. Uh, card in the deck just because uh, most of the deck is dark so dark light isn't dead most of the time and lastly metaverse is really cool just because it gets you access to your fusion recycling plant but because you only have one fusion in the extra deck it's not as impactful but nevertheless good card another way to get to your fusion 
And lastly, Dark Paladin. We've talked about Dark Paladin in the Streets of Battle City deck uh, box, but um, just to reiterate, really good boss monster. Great card overall, has a negate, it's huge under certain circumstances, but great card overall. But yeah, like overall, I'm super impressed with Yugi's uh, Dark Paladin strategy. The monsters were a bit lacking in my opinion. The skilled white magician and the skilled red magician were not. I wasn't a huge fan of these cards alongside the uh, Archer and Gilfer. Also, Dark Magician and Buster Blade are two cards that I'm not a huge fan of also in main decks just because they are bricks on their own regard. But given just how many fusion spells you have in the deck, I, I'll let it slide. But yeah, overall the deck, pretty solid. Now let's go ahead and talk about the skill, which is a really cool skill also. So the skill that Yugi got is Magician's Act, which is really funny because we have Arcana here instead of uh, instead of Yugi himself. And yes, I ended up even taking a look at like manuals for the game because uh, if you ever opened up one of these boxes, you'll get like the full uh, paper mat that has all the deck lists listed for you. I had to go out of my way to find all this stuff. So so yeah, this is the skill you're meant to be playing with Yugi's deck, <laughs> which is funny. So the skill reads, activate one of the following skills at the start of the duel. Add one Dark Magician from your deck to your hand then shuffle one card from your hand into the deck. Okay, so that's a pretty cool effect, just being able to get access to your Dark Magician a lot easier, and if you happen to have Buster Blitter in hand already, plus a Fusion Spell, which seems very likely, honestly, um, you can get your final piece with this skill. As for the other effect, it reads, shuffle one Dark Magician from your hand into the deck, then draw one card. I like the flexibility of this, honestly. These two effects are great and have such uh, versatility uh, at the start of the duel, so they're both awesome. But the effect continues. During your main phase, you contribute one monster whose original name is Dark Magician to draw two cards. Each of these skills can only be used once per duel. Overall, I have no complaints about this skill. The only thing I could really say is that I would have loved to have seen the skill say something along the lines of add a Dark Magician or a Buster Blader from your deck to your hand. But honestly, again, this is just me being nitpicky. And besides that, yeah, no, this is a great skill with a really decent deck. I think because of that, um, I have to place this deck really highly. But overall, being a B tier is not bad whatsoever. All right then, so next up we have another Yugi deck. Funny enough, Yugi ended up getting three decks in this box, which is really funny. Um, you don't see that that very often anymore. All right, so the next deck Yugi has up is the Magnet deck. And oh my god, I was so unbelievably impressed with this deck. And I think, let's see, where does it go? It's at least in B tier, I think. Um, it beats that, it beats that, I think it beats that. Honestly? Hmm, it might beat that. Does it beat that though? I'm gonna say it's like a really high B tier and that is insane. Um, maybe below Cloudian actually. Yeah, I'll put it below Cloudian, but excellent strategy. It's so good actually. It's really, really good. Let's talk about it. All right, so this is Yugi's Magnet strategy. And of course, we have the main cards in the strategy, Valkyrion, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. All cards that are essential to the strategy just because you want to be able to summon Valkyrion. But additionally, we also have Delta, which is huge. Delta is such a good piece for magnets that I was flabbergasted at the thought that this card was actually printed alongside these cards. It's one of the best of the magnets, and I feel like if this deck ended up getting any more magnets, it would have been extremely busted. But moving on, we do start getting a few stinkers. Cards like Giant Soldier Stone, Destroyer Golem, and Rock Spirit. All three of these cards I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, Destroyer Golem being the worst of them all just because it just serves no purpose besides being a rock. Giant Soldier Stone, I'll let it pass just because it's a 2k defense. And Rock Spirit, I guess it's just an extender just to get more damage on field. Whatever. Moving on, we also have Grand Merc. Honestly, just getting access to a Monarch is huge. These cards are very powerful, easily summonable, and... Grand Merc has a really good effect in being able to destroy any set card on the field. Uh, moving on, we also have Absorbing Jar, which I am not a huge fan of Absorbing Jar. It's an interesting card just because it's able to destroy all uh, set spell and trap cards on the field. So it can prove to be a like huge impact maker during a duel if your opponent went ham and ended up setting all their back row and you set your Absorbing Jar. You can just like knock him out of the duel really quickly. But I won't knock it too much. At least Absorbing Jar isn't a bad card. Lastly, for the monsters, we have Block Golem. And this card is so cool. It's one of those cards that I didn't know actually existed because I'm familiar with um with Block Dragon, which is a broken card that's banned at the TCG, but I didn't know about Block Golem. And I was very pleasantly surprised with this card because if you've never read this card, it reads 
Uh, if all the monsters in your graveyard are Earth, which pretty much the whole deck is, uh, you can tribute this card, then target two level four lower rock monsters in your graveyard, except Block Golem, and special summon those rock monsters. But their effects on field can't be activated. That's fine, that's whatever, honestly. Because the main thing we're going to be doing with Block Golem is recycling your Magnet Warriors, and that's super important for this deck, and you'll see why. But just having access to this card is insane. Moving on, we have only two spell cards to speak of, but they're both really good. Uh, Attack the Moon is a really good uh, piece of support for this deck just because it's a way to deal with back row continuously. And you, as you can see right here, we have a card that already helps with that, which is really cool. But the card that I actually want to talk about more extensively is, is Magnetic Field, the field spell for the deck. And this field spell does so much for this deck just because it's able to make it to where any magnet monster is a thorn on your opponent's side of the field. The field spell is very simple. First, uh, if you control an earth rock monster, which is the whole deck, you can target a level 4 logo magnet warrior in the graveyard to special summon it. That level of recursion is insane. As you can see, a lot of this deck is just helping you recur these magnets, and you'll see why. Once per turn, during the end of the damage step, when an earth rock monster you control battle an opponent's monster, and that monster was not destroyed, you bounce back that opponent's monster back to the hand. This is really, really strong, and un under certain game states can pretty much just beat your opponent outright. We currently have a card in the game, um, Grand Wall, which is a very powerful card that makes it really annoying for your opponent to have to like continuously commit to the board. This field spell essentially makes all your magnets essentially become a budget version of Grand Wall, which is still really good. And the fact that this field spell also recurs your magnets back to the field means that you can continue to keep using these effects over and over again until you just out-research your opponent and just overwhelm them. Wrapping up the deck, we have the trap cards, and they're really good too. I already alluded to this, but zero gravity. Not only is this an offensive slash defensive card by being able to tactically change the battle position of your opponents of all monsters on the field, but also this card allows you to enable attack the moon, which in order to deal with your opponent's back row. So I love the multi versatility of it. Additionally, we also have a card like Mind Crush, which is a more situational card. But nevertheless, if you have a good read on your opponent, what they're playing, this is a huge card. Rock Bombardment is awesome just because it's foolish burial for rock monsters specifically and it has the added benefit of burning your opponent for 500. Sealing Ceremony of Mokuton, um, it's a more niche card but dealing with your opponent's graveyard isn't bad. Unbreakable Spirit, uh, it's a funny card just because whenever I look at the art of this card I never think it's a real Yu-Gi-Oh card just because it looks so different from typical Yu-Gi-Oh art but that's not a tangent of its own. But nevertheless, this card's actually really good as well. Given it is a more budget version of like Sakuretsu armor, but in a one-to-one -one matchup, yeah, if you activate this card, you're always going to be able to out any opponent's monster. And given the fact that with the magnets on the field, you're always bouncing back cards on your opponent's side of the field, this is a very likely thing to happen. So I like it a lot. Magnet Force and Magnet Conversion are two really good cards as well. While Magnet Force does get protection to your magnets from um, monster effect destructions, uh, which isn't super common. And nevertheless, protection is protection. And Magnet Conversion is another piece of recursion for your magnets in the graveyard. But not only that, but the fact that this card has an additional effect while it's in the grave, being able to special summon any of your uh, A level 4 lower Magnet Ward that was banished is really cool. Especially when you can take into consideration that Rock Spirit is a card in this deck. As you can see, this deck is very well constructed. It's very, very good. And it was, it was astonishing to see just how well constructed it was. And here's the thing, it gets better. The skill is just as good as the deck, and its name is Magnetic Attraction, which reads, Flip this card over when you activate the skill, apply the following skills. When a level 4 lower magnet monster is normal summoned, you can add one level 4 lower magnet monster with a different name from your deck to your hand. What? We have more consistency. That is insane. And when you take into consideration that the deck already has 4 level 4 lower magnet monsters, this means that you're going to be able to have this effect go off very, very often for extreme uh, consistency in this strategy. Also, uh, there's another part to this effect which reads, you can reveal two level four or lower Magnum Warrior monsters with different names from your hand, and if you do, add a Valkyrian from your deck to your hand. And this is the cherry on top for this strategy. Whenever you are able to accumulate multiple Magnum monsters in your hand, you can then just search out the boss of the deck, which is insane. Uh, this skill pretty much does it all. Being able to recur you your low uh, low level magnets and add you to your boss is really really good. But of course the skill did have to be balanced with a once per duel on each of these effects, which is completely reasonable. And honestly, after taking a look at it again, um, 
I think I want to bump up this deck a bit more. And you know what? We're going to bump this guy up to... You know what? I'm going to make two changes. I remember in the last uh, episode in the series, uh, someone in the comment section said that they think that uh, Neo Spatian should have been higher in A tier, and I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I am very biased, uh, and I was trying to keep my bias in check last time. But I think that Magnets are possibly a top of B tier strategy. No, it's an A tier. It's a low A tier. I think it crosses the threshold for that. Um, yeah, no, the deck is just very good. It's very consistent as to what it's trying to do. I'm surprised. I didn't think it was going to be this high, but yeah, impressive strategy. All right. So last strategy for Yugi is my personal favorite, the Phantom Beast strategy. And man, I wish I could say this is like a A to B tier strategy, but it's not. It's really not. Um, This is probably, I'd say it's like a C tier strategy. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I think it's like, I think it's above the Vera Hunter strategy. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about why. All right, then. So as I mentioned, Yugi's deck is the Phantom B strategy, and I wish this deck was better because it's really cool, really fun, especially when you have a constructed version of it. So yeah, the stars of the show here are going to be the Gazelle and the Burfamont, two really underwhelming cards that make a more underwhelming boss monster in Chimera, the Flying Mythical Beast. One of my personal favorite DM era cards. I love the artwork of this card, but it's just not a good card. But besides that, we also have a few cards that are going to help us supplement this strategy with cards like Phantom Beast Crosswing, Wildhorn, and Thunder Pegasus. All three of these cards are really fun. Crosswing gives all Phantom Beast monsters on the field a 300 attack boost. Uh, Wildhorn, while on field, is able to do piercing damage. And finally, Thunder Pegasus gives a Phantom Beast monster you control uh, battle protection, which is really nice. And all three of these cards work to uh, boost each other, and not only that, but boost your Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast, which is awesome. The one thing that I don't like about this card is that they don't help Burfamont. They do help Gazelle, which is cool, but not Burfamont, which is like the odd one out. And this card really, really frustrates me, I'm not going to lie. All right, but continuing on, we have cards like Giant Rat, which is always great consistency. We have Bazoo, which is a great normal summon. Uh, Manticore is interesting. Enraged Battle Locks is great for uh, beating down on your opponent. Ghost Knight of Jackal, I'm not a huge fan of in this strategy. My main issue with this card is that we have a total of four tribute monsters in the deck in Jackal King, uh, Behemoth, and Green Baboon alongside the Burfamont. And that's, that's a lot of them, which makes the deck very prone to being like, to having bricky hands. And at that, cards like uh, Behemoth, the King of All Animals, is only okay. While Green Baboon, uh, Defender of the Forest, is actually a really good card, uh, just because it has a, a certain level of recursion. The monster roster is not that bad, with the exception of like, the multiple tribute monsters, which we could have done with quite a few less. Uh, but moving on to the spell cards, they're pretty decent also. Wild Nature's Release is a really interesting way of just trying to get extra damage and possibly go for game. The big march of animals is also interesting just because we're also trying to get some extra damage in uh whenever you have a full board spiritual force is a really nice card uh this does give a certain level of protection to all your monsters which are very prone to being destroyed fire from ancient tanky is another piece of consistency and the big cattle drive is fun but it's very hard to pull off in my opinion Moving on to the trap cards, they're not half bad. Uh, Ryoku Field is a very niche trap card, but it's not so niche that it would never come up. How the Wild is a funny card. It's not good. It's just funny just because you can tack on some extra burn down with your opponent. And Horn of the Phantom Beast is genuinely a really good card, allowing you to make cards like, uh, like Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast an actual threat on the field. But realistically, the best way to use this card is usually on a card like, um, where is it at? Uh, Phantom Beast the Wild Horn. Just making him really huge and just doing crazy amount of damage and applying a lot of pressure. And we already talked about it, but Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast is a really underwhelming monster. As you can see, there was no fusion spell in this deck. And the reason why is because you're supposed to summon your boss monster with your skill. And the skill for this deck is Beast of Phantoms, which reads... During your main phase, discard one card, then fusion summon one Chimera the Flying Mythical Beast from your extra deck using monsters from your hand or field as fusion materials. During the end phase, if the Chimera the Mythical Beast was fusion summoned this turn, you can add one Phantom Beast monster from your graveyard to your hand. Each of these skills can only be used once per turn. 
and yeah here's the thing i am not a huge fan of this skill just because it's very underwhelming and if the skill was better honestly this could have bumped up the strategy a lot higher uh just because if it gave you a way to like i don't know reduce the level of uh performant in hand so you can normal summon them to search out the chimera that would have been nice or even if the skill acted more like Alexis's uh, Cyber Blader skill, where I allowed you to use one material on field plus one from deck in order to make the fusion a lot easier, and then additionally giving the uh, the boss monster an additional effect. Any of these changes would have significantly boosted the power of this deck, but the fact that it requires you to discard a card to just perform a fusion summon for a bad card is really underwhelming, and at that, being able to add a Phantom Beast back to your hand isn't that great because most of them want to be in the graveyard just because they don't do much on field. And that's the disappointing thing about this deck. Honestly, I wish I could have rated it higher. It's a, as I said, this is my personal favorite deck from this whole box. I love this deck a lot, especially when it's in a constructed form. But in sealed, it's just, it's mediocre, honestly. All right, then. So now that we're done with Yugi, now comes Kaiba. And wow, he is coming in swinging we have his union deck and this honestly is hmm how good is this deck i thought this deck was going to be higher in my opinion but realistically i think this might be just like a high b tier strategy i think it's like below the skill dark magician deck that's crazy honestly man this deck used to be like a top tier strategy uh, in its heyday uh, let's go ahead and see let's go ahead and discuss why it's so low all right then, so here we have Kaiba's Union deck, and yeah, overall, I like this deck, but there's a, quite a few pieces that I am not a huge fan of. So starting off, we have the trio, x Head Cannon, Y-Head Dragon, and Z-Middle Tank. All really cool cards. Some of the coolest in, like, all of DM. I love the artwork, and I'm so happy that these cards all got retrains. They're so cool. I'm planning on copying them the second they're out. Um, but besides those cards, we also have the plain pseudo archetype thing uh those being the the victory viper the jade knight the falchion and what else counts in this and the delta tri all four of these cards are very underwhelming i mean victory viper isn't bad just because it's able to get pretty big at a decent rate um but it's pretty small to start off with jade knight's kind of cool just because whenever it is destroyed it does give you access to uh, your union pieces, which is really cool. Um, Delta Trio is just bad. And Falchion B is another really bad card in my opinion, just because the effect to send a light machine from the deck to the graveyard doesn't work on, on the on the main pieces you want in grave. And I think that really docks it down points. But besides those cards, we also have the heavy mech support platform, which is only okay. Uh, Ducker Mobile Cannon is interesting, but not crazy good. Uh, Machina Gearframe and Peacekeeper are actually two genuinely good cards, uh, just because this is a great normal summon that adds you Peacekeeper, and Peacekeeper, when it's destroyed, it adds you a union from the next to the hand, which is really nice. And that's the monster lineup. Uh, I'm very conflicted with the monsters just because I'm not a huge fan of a lot of these cards, just because they kind of don't help the strategy, which is kind of like a downside to it. Onto the spell cards, this is where things get a lot better. United with Stand and Solitary Sword of Poison are two phenomenal equip souls very very powerful frontline base is it's okay uh machine assembly line it does give all your machines a nice little attack boost so that's never bad and um whenever you accumulate enough counters it does give you let you revive a monster in the graveyard which is always really nice finally we have the card that actually makes the deck union hanger and this is the card that made the deck so unbelievably powerful back in its heyday having access to union hanger is ridiculous what are the best field spells um ever printed i think it's it's so so good in everything it does essentially if you open union hanger and sealed with this you kind of just win the duel just because it's just so powerful but this is only a one of in the deck with no real way to get access to it which really hinders it finally for the trap cards we have formation union and rollout which are two cards that are really underwhelming in my opinion rare metamorph is really good and union scramble is even better so the trap cards are hit or miss honestly and lastly we have the fusions and honestly yeah all these fusions are great they all have their own uh, unique versatility but they're all really really good 
And now that we've covered the main deck, let's go ahead and talk about the skill, which is a really, really good skill, but just not in this deck particularly. So the skill for this deck is Union Combination. And if you've played Speed Duel for a bit now, you know the skill all too well. The skill reads, once per turn, during your main phase, you can place one card from your hand to the bottom of the deck, then special summon one Light Machine Fusion monster from your extra deck. That can't be Fusion Summoned. Using monsters from your field or graveyard as fusion material, ignoring its summoning condition. For the rest of this turn, your opponent takes no damage. Um, so yeah. This skill essentially makes it as to where your XYZ uh, fusion monsters are treated the same way as the ABC fusions, if you're familiar with those. Allowing you to use your monsters on the field and graveyard is very, very powerful. However, this is where my issue comes with the deck. The deck has a lot of things going for it, and the main thing that... I dislike is the fact that the deck has a strategy you're trying to make your fusions duh but it doesn't give you any resources that help you with that specifically it would have been very nice if the deck had access to a card like um i don't know metaverse that would have been cool to get access to your uh broken field spell foolish burial would have been also very good to go ahead and dump some of your uh union pieces into the graveyard in order to have easier access to activation of the of the skill Maybe even terraform, uh, not terraforming, <laughs> um, my bad, uh, planet pathfinder. That would have been another really good card. That, this is my main issue with the deck and seal. It's just that it has, it's trying to move in too many directions in order to be consistent in it's what it's trying to do. By no means is it a bad strategy. It's upside is huge, but when you have underwhelming hands where you open multiple of the ships, it can get really, really hard to win duels, especially against the better decks in the, in the tier list. It's honestly crazy to think that this deck is as slow as it is. And as I said, in its heyday, it was one of the most formidable strategies in all of speed duels. And I might even be being generous right now with leaving it this high in B tier. But you know what? We'll give it the respect that it deserves. All right then. So next up, we have Kaiba's... The name of the deck was called Dragon, but that's not even... You know what? Um, This deck, it's... um, Let's see. It's like a like a high C tier, I think. No. Yeah, I think it, that's where it goes. Let's see if I change my mind. All right, guys. So this is Kaiba's Dragon deck. And as you can see off the jump, um, that's a lot of vanillas here. Blue Eyes, Soggy, Sword Stalker, Legend, Vorge Raider, and Dark Blade. All these cards being vanillas isn't the worst thing. Dark Blade, Vorge Raider, Legend are all really good normal summons. They're all huge normal summon cards. Sagi, however, is a really bad card. Sword Stalker is okay as far as tribute monsters go, and Blue Eyes, it's cool and iconic, but uh, for it being a two tribute monster, not really my first choice when summoning monsters. Moving on, we finally have some effect monsters in Maha Vilo, Zombria the Dark, Spear Dragon, and Kaiser Glider. Now we have a lot better cards. Maha Vilo is a lot more niche just because it requires multiple equip spells to be good. Zombria is just a really nice monster overall. Spear Dragon is great for aggressive decks, and Kaiser Collider, as far as trippy monsters go, you can do way worse. Moving on to the spell cards, we have some pretty decent ones. Being Sanctuary is very cool just because 1. It's a deterrent for your opponent to attack into, and for 2. Um, if you have a trippy monster in the hand, you can just summon it out really quickly. Soul Exchange, again, really nice for you able to get rid of your opponent's pop back monsters and summon it for one of yours. Shrink. Awesome card, we still need a reprint of this. Konami, please, next speed duel box, let's get this printed. Mage Power, this is just a good card overall. And Silent Doom is interesting. Now we're on to the trap card. After Trap Hole is an interesting trap card just because uh, often enough, a lot of the monsters that your opponent's going to be setting are going to have very high defenses. Not all of them are going to be cracking 2k, but a good amount of them will. So it's a very iffy card. Negate Attack, it does what it says. Magic Drain is just very nice for forcing your opponent to like either read this card a resource or just negating a spell card which is always nice final attack order the deck is very aggressive so this card makes sense and inspiration again aggressive deck makes sense but here's the thing the deck is slightly off we're not supposed to have dark blade here instead the card that's supposed to be here is obelisk the torment which is really really interesting and i'll show you why i'm saying this the skill that Kai was expected to play with this deck is, it's no monster, it's a god. And the skill reads, activate this skill during your main phase. 
discard any number of cards, minimum one, then add one Obelisk to Tormentor from your deck or graveyard to your hand. This skill can only be used once per duel. Don't get me wrong, the skill isn't bad. Being able to discard anything to get access to Obelisk is not a bad effect. The main issue with the deck is that it's not good at swarming the field. Don't get me wrong, you'll probably get multiple monsters on your field, but at that point, I feel like most of the time, you're probably better off keeping all three monsters on your field over just summoning Obelisk uh, as like a flex. So it just doesn't seem to be concurrent with what the deck is trying to do. But besides that, um, you know what? I think I graded this deck too low. It's a lot more aggressive than I remember it being. So it's probably like a higher B tier, uh, higher C tier strategy. So yeah, I think the deck is aggressive enough to beat out everything here. So we'll put it at high C tier. All right then, so next up we have Loomis and Umbra's Masked Beast deck. And this is, um, let me think. This is probably like mid C tier deck, maybe like right here. The deck is okay, it's not that bad. Um, yeah, I think that's where it belongs. Wait, no, it's, you know what? I think it's like a D tier strategy. It's like probably like top of D tier. All right, let's check out why exactly I think so. Okay, so Loomis and Umbra's deck is all based around making their ritual monster, that being the Mask Beast. And it's not the worst strategy ever. The main thing is that um, some of the cards that it has in the deck aren't that great. And let's go ahead and talk about those. So starting off in the monster lineup, we have cards like the Mask Beast Gradius, which is not good. It's actually a bad card and um, not a huge fan of it, it's just kind of like a brick in the strategy, but at least it works as tribute fodder for the ritual summon, so I guess it has that going for it. Um, then we have a bunch of vanilla monsters in Shining Abyss, Grantic Elder, Melkit the Four-Faced Beast, Beast of Tawar, and Optoclops. A lot of these cards are really bad. From Shining Abyss to all the way to the Four-Faced Beast, these are all bad cards. Uh, Beast of Tawar is a decent tribute monster, and Optoclops is just an overall decent uh, normal summon just because it's large. But moving on, we have some decent effect monsters. Well, Evolution is a really nice, uh, is a very nice defensive card. And Night Assailant, well, it's a pretty good card. It's, it's only serves the purpose of being Man Eater Book when it's uh, destroyed. Because it's effective to target a flip monster in the graveyard, it's not going to be coming up in this deck particularly. Uh, lastly, we have Ritual Raven, which is a great piece of support for any ritual based strategy that summons dark monsters, but it's a one for the deck and there's no real way to search it out. So that kind of sucks. And the Mass Beast, as I mentioned, um, it's not that good of a ritual monster. At least it's large. It's huge. 3200 attack points is very big. Um, and its level isn't the worst, but still, um, it is quite the commitment in order to summon it. Moving on to the spell cards now. Nobleman of Extermination, I actually kind of like a lot. Um, I think it has a really cool effect. And being able to destroy any uh, set card is really nice. And it has the added benefit of if it destroys a trap card, you're able to banish every single copy from either player's deck. So that's pretty cool. Moving on, we have a couple of the Mask cards. Mask of Brutality is really decent. I mean, it's pretty good for aggressive strategies. Mask of Remnant is not good, though. The Mask of Remnants is actually a really bad card. I don't like this at all. It's very gimmicky. Um, the Curse of Mask Beast, yeah, it's expected to see this card. However, the big card in this is Pre-Preparation of Rights. This card is awesome. It's great. It's very powerful. And the main... And typically, if you open this card you're in a really good position. So, good card. Moving on to the trap cards now, and the lineup is, again, pretty mixed. Widespread Rune is great. Mask of Weakness is a little underwhelming, but it's not bad. Bark of Dark Ruler, again, it's a card that I talked about in my um, Shadow of the Duelist set. Uh, it's it's a decent card. I'm not a huge fan of it, but it's not bad. Salt Emotion is whatever, and Dark Smog, I feel it has no real purpose in this deck. So it's, it's a mech card. Let's go ahead and talk about the skill now. The skill this deck gets access to is called Spell of Mask, which reads, flip this card over when you activate the skill, activate the following skills. If a ritual summoned the Mask Beast you control is destroyed by an opponent's card effect, you can special summon one Mask Beast Gradius from your hand, deck, or graveyard, ignoring its summoning condition. This effect would be good, but summoning the Mask Beast is not that easy, just because it's not the easiest card to search out in your deck if you don't open the um, pre-preparation rights. And also, it's going to take quite the commitment with needing a monsters that equal the level of 8 in order to summon it. So that's 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 quite a bit uh, to go into that ritual summon. The second effect is you can trigger one Mass Beast Gradius, then add one the Mass Beast and one Curse of the Mass Beast from your deck 
or graveyard to your hand. Each of these skills can only be used once per duel. Now, this second effect is okay, it's not that bad, but summoning Mass Beast Desk Radius is not the easiest thing. Don't get me wrong, the summoning condition isn't the hardest, at least you have multiple choices as to what cards you can tribute for it to be brought out. However, getting those cards on the field and letting them survive for multiple turns until you're able to assemble everything is still not super easy and not very reliable. So that's why I don't particularly love this skill in the breakdown of this deck. So yeah, because of those reasons, I think that this strategy struggles a lot because for one, it's a ritual based strategy. For two, the monster you're summoning isn't the easiest card to bring out. And finally, a lot of the pieces of support that you have in the deck don't particularly push it above the echelon of being more uh, viable. I feel like if the three vanilla monsters that you had access to uh, had higher stat lines, like at least 1800 baseline, I would have bumped it up a bit more just because at least you could like realistically stay in a duel for longer until you found all your pieces. But because they're not, uh, I can't really justify having it be any higher. All right, then. So moving on now, we have Ishizu's fairy strategy. And this is, um, let me think. I think I'm going to put it somewhere in C tier. This is probably a good spot for it. Um, yeah, that's probably a good spot for it, I think. All right, let's go ahead and talk about it. So for Shizu's deck, they pretty much gave her a ton of fairy monsters, and particularly the Earth Fairy cards with Keldo, Mudora, Zolga, and Kelbeck. Um, but yeah, I mean, the notable ones, I guess, are like Mudora, which can get fairly big if you can set it up. Uh, Zolga is cute, I suppose. Kelbeck is interesting, uh, just because uh, if your opponent attacks to it while it's in defense mode, you're able just to bounce back that card, so that's pretty neat. And Kaldo is very situational. Um, overall, I'm not super impressed with these cards in particular. But moving on, we also have cards like Skell Angel, which is not bad. It's just a free draw, and that's never a bad thing. Um, and another notable card is Dimensional Alchemist, which is a card that I'm actually a big fan of. But I don't know how much application it has in this strategy specifically. Oh, I forgot. A Bones Alone is another card that's in this deck also. And actually, I really like this card in this deck. Um, it works surprisingly well. But now onto some of the cards that I'm not super big on. Those being the crap ton of tribute monsters in the deck. Angel 07, a Guardian Angel Joanne, Moisture Creature, and Archetype Parshaft. Parshaft is the only one that I'm actually uh, really happy to see in this deck in particular. Um, just because it's such a it's such a great card, and I am very biased towards Parshaft. It's uh, it's one of those cards that I enjoy playing a lot during Goat Era, so do mind my bias. However, cards like Moisture Creature, Guardian Angel Joanne, and Angel 07, I'm not huge on these, just because all of them require at least two tributes in order to break them out. And at that, Moisture Creature, if you have, want to have any effect on it, you need to tribute a whole three cards. That's ridiculous. Additionally, I feel like none of these cards in particular really warrant you having to tribute multiple monsters in order to summon them, with the exception of like Angel 07. The effect is pretty neat. And yeah, this deck isn't really able to facilitate that all that well. So that's why I'm not a huge fan of them. Moving on to the spell cards now, and they are actually great. We have Nobleman of Crossout, which is a phenomenal piece of support. Foolish Burial, great utility card. Cosmic Cyclone, the second best type of back removal. Cestus of Dalga and Valhalla are two great cards for their fairy strategies, just because uh, the Dalga gives you a nice attack boost, and the Valhalla lets you cheat out pretty much your whole deck. So these two cards are phenomenal. Moving on to the trap cards, and they're pretty good as well. Ropa Life is a really nice way of re uh, recovering a monster that was destroyed by battle. Waboku allows you to live a turn, which is really nice. Drop Off is really annoying for your opponent to deal with, and Lost Wind is very situational, but when it pops off, it's really, really good. As for Ishizu's skill, I actually quite like it. Um, it's not that bad. It's nothing crazy impressive, but it gets the job done. Her skill's name is Rise of the Fallen, and it reads, Activate this skill during your main phase. Special in 1, level 4, lower fairy monster from your graveyard in defense position. And gain life points equal to its original attack. This skill can only be used once per duel. The effect is very simple. Just allowing you to special summon any fairy monster in your graveyard is very nice. And you have multiple ways of summoning those cards. With cards like Foolish Burial, well, mainly just Foolish Burial, honestly, I don't even know why I said multiple, but just the fact that you're able to just essentially summon a card for free from your graveyard, it's really nice. And it allows place uh, to summon Parshav to be a lot easier. 
So really cool. But yeah, overall, Ishizu's deck is nothing that impressive. It's just a very mediocre uh, strategy that has some nice utility to it. All right, then last deck up is Esperoba's Jinzo deck. And this is, man, this deck is bad. Um, This is going to be one of those F tier strategies, in my opinion. And I think it's probably like the king of F tier. So I don't know what the thing is with Konami and giving Esperoba really bad decks because this strategy in particular doesn't deserve to be called the Jinzo deck because it's just imagine your pile of cards you have in like in a shoebox stored away this is what you get here we have cards like Jinzo which is a phenomenal boss monster that the Mega Saber is budget Cyber Dragon Freed I hate this card I genuinely do not like this card um it's just because for one it serves no utility in this deck not really and for two its effect is just really bad just working as a rota and don't get me wrong rota is great but to give up your draw in order to just search out a level four lower warrior monster is not it's not my favorite effect i'll just say that moving on we also have mysterious guard which is a interesting card i'm not a huge fan of it but it's not it's not the worst thing ever exile force is genuinely really good and then for some reason they decided to give esperoba pac-man I, I don't know why there's the deck doesn't support pac-man whatsoever but i guess it's here uh moving on we also have some dark scorpions too with gorg and uh meanie which are two of the worst ones overall yeah the monster lineup is really bad the the only notable cards in this are exile force and i guess the fiend mega saber and jinzo but besides that everything else is very very bad Moving on, we have the spell cards, which consists of Amplifier, which is okay, whatever. Lightning Blade, you don't have enough warriors in order to facilitate this. Preacher Swap, I guess, yeah, you're going to have enough shitty monsters that you're going to want to change them with your opponent. Uh, Rhoda, again, I don't know what exactly you're trying to search. I guess Exile Force and Meanie, sure. The Warrior Returning Alive, <laughs> again. For some reason, they were really set on monster, on warrior monsters. I, I, I don't understand. Hammer Shot's actually genuinely good. And Hidden Armory, I guess if you really want to get access to that Lightning Blade, sure. And then we have the Trap Cards, which are pretty okay. Uh, Draining Shield, really nice. Psychic Shockwave, um, very situational, but if you're able to pull it off, can be very much like a tempo swing, being able to summon Jinzo from the deck. And finally, Battle Guard Rage is another card that deals with Warriors. Awesome. And just to make sure that I'm not tripping, let's check out how many Warriors we have in this deck. We have uh, Meanie, we have Gorg. We have Exile, and we have Freed. Oh, I guess the Fiend Mega Saber too. That's five warriors, and two of them, no, three of them are tribute monsters. Yeah, um, I don't really understand. <laughs> but let's go ahead and move on to Esperoba's skill now. Esperoba's skill is, it's Jinzo. And the skill reads, Jinzo monsters you control are unaffected by your opponent's skill cards. That's genuinely really good. Once per turn, during your main phase, if you control Jinzo, you can look at one phase down card in your opponent's spell and trap card zone, and if it's a trap card, draw one card. Overall, this effect isn't bad. Giving Jinzo protection from certain skills can be very nice. It's very situational, but it's a nice effect to have. And giving yourself the ability to look at set cards is cool. Again, I'm trying to find any silver lining for this deck. Um, I think I rated it too high now. <laughs> Let's go back to the tier list. Taking a look at it again, I think this is probably going... Yeah, we'll say it's right there. It's going to be above the Gate Guardian strategy in the other Jinzo deck, but man, this is a bad deck. Like, it's bad, bad. All right, guys, and with that, this concludes the final part of rating every single speed duel deck from the sealed boxes. Um, again, I had a ton of fun doing this. Um, it was incredibly interesting to go ahead and grade all these decks, taking a look at them again, and going ahead and doing a deep dive. I did have a couple of other ideas that uh, that I wanted to go ahead and toy around with. I thought about possibly going back to rate all the other structure decks that we've gotten in Speed Duel's history. I feel like that could be really fun to do in a tier list as well. I've also uh, been suggested in the comment section below uh, an idea of how I would fix each of these decks to make them all better. That could be really fun to explore as well. And if you guys have any of your own personal suggestions, let me know in the comment section below. I'll be happy to read them all and consider any ideas you guys may have. I've been enjoying making this speed duel content and am expecting to make a lot more going forward. 
Well, with that being said, guys, thank you so much for stopping by. Please leave a like if you enjoyed and subscribe so you never miss any of my videos. But with that, I've been Topsy. Thank you so much and have a great one. Bye.